And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Yes. Buddy! Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on film. I mean, who isn't? It, it's sweeping the nation. We, we, we have fans. We're like, we're like the flight of the Concords of podcasts in that we don't have fans. We have fan. Yes. We have a fan and that's Mel. <laughs> but, uh, only the real fans, the true fans, the hardcore fans who have been with us since the beginning, only they would know the two basic facts about the both of us, the two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest will they or won't they couple, Bunny and Malin. First and foremost, the first fact, Bunny, which is about you, is that when you are not doing the podcast, you are making quite a name for yourself in the world of gourmet cupcakes you have become a very big gourmet cupcake uh baker chef however you want to be uh yes. referred um so tell us bunny how did you get started in that field what drew it to you and what sort of cupcake flavors are you coming up with well the biggest trick of this is that it on on first in a very well-to-do neighborhood uh and the real trick is is that these are very 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 exclusive gourmet cupcakes which means i rarely ever actually bake a cupcake there is nice. just a waiting list for the cupcakes, and I make the money off of the waiting list itself. Oh my god, it's like Ron Swanson and his chairs. Yeah. It's exactly what this is. Ron Swanson only makes like five chairs a year, and there's a waiting list for his chairs. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and it nice. is it is very it is a very big status symbol amongst the rich to be on my cupcake. Nice, nice, good for you. Get that hustle, get that gain. The edibles yeah. just kicked in. Now, just to let everyone know, for all of you playing playing along at home. Now the secret to the cupcakes itself is the very, very rare ingredients used in the cupcakes. Ooh, like what? Which makes the cupcakes themselves rare. Meteor dust... Nice. Is, ...is one ingredient, and, you know, it's very, very hard to collect meteor, meteor dust. Yeah. You know, and... You can't really just get a meteor. Yeah. David Bowie sweat. David Bowie sweat. Yes. Hard to get. That is very hard to get, especially now. There is a big been, been a big shortage of David Bowie sweat as David Bowie dries out. Here's another rare ingredient. Muppet teeth. Muppet teeth. Those are hard to get. Those are those very are hard, hard to get. get. Yeah. Are, mostly because those little fuckers are so fast. They are fast. Jesus, you take out the pliers and they are gone. Oh my God. Where did I hear that? Where did I hear that? Where did that come from? The MTV's The State. They had a skit where, uh, uh, like this rich family were eating a uh, Muppet meat and the way that they, uh, Oh, how do you catch the Muppet? Oh, really easy. Gee, I wish someone could tell me how to count to five. And then a Muppet appears in the window and then they catch it and beat the shit out of it. <laughs> it's like, Ooh, let me try. I wish someone could sing a song to me about how to wash my hands. And then boom, 
a Muppet shows up. That's how you do it. You got to con them. Yeah. You know? My wife's work setup is great. I've got three screens. I feel like I feel like I'm either uh, an actual professional podcaster for once or I'm, I'm just playing real life Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah. And I got a bunch of screens. Uh, my kids are obsessed with the Five Nights at Freddy's games, and uh, I, they, their minds got blown because a Blumhouse is working on a big budget Hollywood movie version of Five Nights at Freddy's, and they cast it, and they cast two names in it. First off, Peta, the little uh loser from uh the Hunger Games. There was the handsome one, and then there was the crappy one that made bread and pretended to be a rock that guy and um matthew lillard and my kids are like i don't know who that is and i'm like yeah you do because he's been fucking shaggy for about 25 years yeah so so they're freaked out like jeepers i have to last five nights at freddy's I can't. That's the closest I can do at a moment's notice to a shaggy voice. But um, Matthew so- Lillard just has a has a kind of presence. Like you would really just want to hang out with Matthew Lillard. Like that sounds like a fun time. Yeah, just yeah. palling around, and you would get into. You you would get into you wouldn't get into trouble with Matthew Lillard, but you would get into hijinks. Yeah, uh, hanging out with Matthew Lillard, I would imagine, is like an invention exchange from Mystery Science Theater. You and Matthew Lillard go out, you have a few shots. Next thing you know, you wake up with a hangover and a tattoo that says Mingo. Yes, that's hanging out with Matthew Lillard. Uh, so that's the first fact <laughs> about Buddy. The second fact, oh, it's fine that we spent so much time talking about this. It's not like I have a huge chap, a huge half coming up. Um, the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do at this portion of the podcast is I like to get a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well and reworded via my own unique storytelling razzmatazz. And that's what this is. Another educationally uneducational installment of historic approximations, or as we like to call it. I just freaked out some other people in the house. Formerly. Oh, oh, hap. Dramatic music. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you. Formerly known as Steve's Historic <laughs> Approximations, or SHAP, as we like to call it repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wanted us to or not. But uh, as catchy as the name SHAP was, a dead name is a dead name for a reason, and so we're moving on. So what is happening on the HAP this week? This week, we are talking about a legendary big-budget Hollywood movie that bombed spectacularly. Except it didn't. And the odd as heck protests that spawned as a result. And this is a two parter because originally the protests were going to be the focus of this uh, segment. But then I learned some some new shit came to light, man. Oh, Uh, she fucking kidnapped herself. Bunny bunny kidnapped herself yes so uh so now there's a two-parter because i uncovered some things but okay so bunny it's it's 1930 in america it's 1930 so uh everyone is doing the charleston flappers are pushing hoops down the street with big long sticks which was the style at the time uh I tied an onion to my belt. Newsies are selling papes on every street corner. It's a menace. Uh, eventually, the president would just start slaughtering them. And uh, everything is in black and white. Now, that's friggin' history. It's a fact. 
Uh, where am there, I? Okay. There, there you go with your critical race theory. Yeah, basically. Ruining, ruining. We, we're in a part of history in America where the old white people who in the 50s and 60s uh, treated minorities horribly are now in their 60s and 70s and 80s and are running the nation and are stopping people from learning about how shitty they were. Yes. That is where we are in America right now. So it's the it's 1930 and there's a movie producer at RKO Pictures whose name is Ernest B. Shodasak. Jesus, that's a triple word score. Ernest B. Shodasak. Yeah. Ernest B. Shodasak, honey. Showing your tits on camera? No, I've got, I've got, I've got a, a, a brawlet. I'm, I'm, if anything, it's a tribute to Selena, the music star. No, I'm early 80s Madonna, lucky star, borderline. But when this podcast gets to my Papa Don't Preach phase, that's when people will tune out. Yes. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> Ernest B. showed us that. Ernie B. works for RKO Pictures. Which was a big time movie How studio. How exactly does a name such as Show the Sack come around? S C H O E D Sack. So I'm not exactly sure. I'm I'm not sure if it's if it's pronounced Show the Sack, but that's how I'm pronouncing it. Ernest B. Show the Sack. Ernie B. He worked for RKO Pictures. I didn't look into RKO Pictures, but I'm assuming. That RKO Pictures was a big time movie studio founded by Randy Orton's great grandfather. Okay. And he was known for just doing like a diamond cutter neck breaker on people. I'm so like, just thinking yeah. that with a name like Shodasak, you know exactly what you're getting when you sign up for that OnlyFans. Yeah, pretty much. And Ernie B, I'm going to call him Ernie B, because that's a lot easier than having to say show to sack over and over again. I feel like I'm going to summon something. Uh, Good, because so, I'm going to giggle every time you say it. So, okay. best so we don't. Ernie, Ernie B has made RKO some money with monkey pictures. Okay. Monkey pictures. Oh, here's a movie about this guy, and he's a traveler in the Congo traveling, fighting monkeys. Oh, here's this guy, and he has to fight this monkey to save this girl. And oh, here's another monkey picture. So he's made some money with monkeys. Ernie B is the monkey guy at Arkeo. Okay. So then a rival studio. Which comes has me that. intrigued and in thinking yeah. many things already. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'll let you know when to put the pictures up. You got those, Bunny? Yes, I do. Okay. So Ernie B is the monkey guy at RKO. And they've made a decent amount of money with these stupid little monkey pictures. So then there's this other studio. They're called Congo Pictures. And they're like, um, it's the 30s. So monkey pics are boppo, baby boy. Howdy, yowza, yowza, yowza. 23 skidoo or whatever. Um, because it's the 1930s is, is so we need to make a big time monkey picture and ours will be different. So put a woman in peril in it, barely dressed because it's the pre code era. So. uh, And so Congo Pictures releases some person has an idea. It's like. What if we made hear me out? It's 1930. I've got this idea for a movie. It's crazy. Hear me out. What if we made a documentary that wasn't true? Oh, a a a a a, a mockumentary, someone might say. So, what if we make a documentary, but we just frigging lie about everything? So they did. They made a fake documentary, and it's called Ngagi. Cue picture number one. You bet this thing is pre-code. 
Look at that poster. That's some pre Hayes code right there. Cause look at yeah. them titties. Yeah. That is crazy. We need to black box those. Anyway, this fake documentary is racist AF. It was billed as an authentic documentary where a famed explorer named Sir Hubert Winstead traveled from London, England to his, the African Congo to be the first person ever to, to capture on camera a, a rare African ritual where native women are kidnapped and given to the mighty gorillas of the jungle as sex slaves. So a couple of things. Number one, it was filmed in L.A. Okay. Uh, number two, it looks like it was filmed in L.A. in the exact same park where they where they uh, where uh, Bella Lugosi is like a uh, wrestling with a rubber octopus at 3 yeah. a.m. Even what happened even the, the picture same? even huh? the picture looks like a drawing of a guy in an ape suit. Yeah, holding a real doll without a wig. That's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. So, it was filmed in LA. There was no Sir Hubert Winstead. The gorillas are a mix of stock footage and dudes in cheap ass gorilla suits. It is racist AF. We went to Africa where uh, African women have sex with monkeys. Can you believe that the blacks do this? That's the, the entire plot of the entire movie. But it was uh, billed, it was billed as an actual real life movie, and, and people flocked to the freaking movie theater because they thought this shit was real because no one had ever made a fake documentary before. And when does this movie come out? 1930. Okay. So uh, it's racist AF. It's a film that one YouTuber called a lost film. No. No, YouTuber. Just because people don't know a film that well, don't make it lost. It's not lost. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's out there. You can find it. Yeah, Another it's not YouTuber... lost if you can find it. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Another YouTuber called it the world's first found footage film. And uh, no, it's not a found footage film. It's not a lost film. Uh, and to be clear, yes, I did fucking find it. And yes, we will do it eventually. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. But one day we will be doing in Gaggy for the freaking podcast. Okay. I done found it. It got into a lot of legal trouble. It, the story of Ngagi is so crazy that that's why this is a two-parter. Because originally, I was just going to talk about this one topic, and then suddenly I learn about this weird-ass fake documentary where uh, women are having sex with, with, gorilla, with gorillas. So, uh, next week, we'll be going in-depth about Ngagi. Yeah. But, Here's what you need to know now. Fake documentary, a crazy hit. It made millions. It is estimated that Ngangi made $4 million in 1930. Wow. In 1930. And eventually the U.S. government had to get involved. But that is for next week. The, the point is, Ngangi, Ngagi is relatively unknown, but let me tell you what shouldn't be unknown. Here's the, here's the real meat of the story, and you may have sensed this, Bunny. Um, no RKO executive has ever admitted this. No RKO executive would ever admit this. The people responsible for this legendary property would never be caught admitting this. However, <clears throat> it's fairly obvious that RKO executive looked at the success of this fake racist ass mockumentary, this cheaply made exploitation film, and said, hey, 
Ernie B, this Ngongi film is making bank. So do us a favor, copy it, make a monkey flick, make a monkey flick for RKO, a big prestige monkey flick. Here's a ton of money. Just make it the biggest and best monkey flick there's ever been. Just make it just like Ngagi, a camera crew, a documentary, uh, women in peril, scantily clad outfits, being given to monkeys, monkeys that want to fuck them. Fuck monkeys. Fuck monkeys. Do it. And I'm sorry, but my friends, this is legitimately how King Kong was made. Haven't you ever wondered that, like, oh, in every itineration of King Kong, there's a 100-foot-tall monster that wants to fuck a 5-foot-tall model? Yes. Haven't you ever wondered why? It's because of this racist freaking movie right here. Well, even when you were describing the the filmmaker i was like i was like that literally just is carl denham yeah that that's exactly the carl denham character yeah he makes monkey but, films yeah so rko saw the popularity of this fake movie and turned this fake movie into a big budget epic prestige film and everyone remembered that <clears throat> and forgot where the idea originally came from, which is right here in this Grindhouse fake documentary. Uh, 1933's original King Kong is just a big budget ripoff of a horribly racist fake documentary. Now that's it for Ngagi this week. Next week, we'll go deep into that film. Uh, hence the two-parter. Be sure to join us next week as we discuss the racist King Kong prequel and the problems it got into with the U.S. government. But for now, we're talking about 1933's King Kong. Groundbreaking special effects. The movie made millions. It was even more successful than Ngongi, Ngagi. And of course, the most iconic scene of the film is the ending where King Kong climbs the M&M store. Oh, wait. I wrote that wrong. <laughs> the Empire State Building. But who... It's the 70s, baby! Everyone's disco dancing. Everyone's getting it. And then, you know what they're doing with it? Putting their weight on it. Because that's yes. what you do. You put your weight on it. Put your weight on it. Put your weight on it. Everyone is smoking grass in Vietnam, and babies are being born with fully grown sideburns. They are literally popping out of the womb sliding out of the slip and slide vagina of their mom already wearing bell bottom jeans that is frigging history uh and this is how the story goes there are two stories one story is almost 100% real and the other story is bullshit and sounds like Tommy Wiseau so this is how it goes the one story is Michael Eisner Pre-Disney CEO, Michael Eisner, is uh, watching TV. He sees King Kong on, and he goes, hey, here's a fairly decent idea. Let's uh, remake King Kong. So he tells the CEO of Paramount Pictures his idea, and they say, okay, we'll put a producer on it. Uh, hey, Dino De Laurentiis, uh, we're going to remake King Kong. We'll give you a crap ton of money. Just go and make this. And so, and he says, uh, okay. I will go and make this film for you, studio executives. That is how it probably happened. But of course, you talk to Dino De Laurentiis, and he says, yes, the whole film was my ideas. The ideas was mine entirely. I say, I say to friends, hey, let's do remake of American King Kong movie film. And it was my idea because I genius. And I, to be clear, I wrote in parentheses, May Lin, say this in a Tommy Wiseau voice. And I think I nailed it. Not bad. Not I bad at it. all. Thank you. Thank you. So they decide to redo King Kong, but for the gritty 1970s. Okay, picture beat. This, now you can put up the second picture. Um, now look, I am not going to tackle the entirety of the making okay, of 19... Okay, no, you got to stop there because that was totally confusing because you said picture me and I, I, I wasn't sure what you meant. I thought maybe oh, no. I you said wanted me to B. picture you as Faye Ray. 
No. Picture B is what oh. I said, not picture me. Picture B. A common okay. mistake. Common mistake. So uh, I'm not going to tackle the entirety of the making of 1976 as King Kong because there have been massive tomes written about how much of a, a, a shit show the making of that movie was. But here's a few bullet points. Jessica Lang plays the young damsel in distress. She was a freaking model who had never acted a day in her life. Yes. Ever. And that just blows my mind because she is amazing in American Horror Story. And sometimes when I hear uh, David Bowie's Life on Mars, uh, in the year 2060, scientists estimate that one out of every three movie trailers will have David Bowie's song Life on Mars during the trailer. Okay. That's okay. just science. It's amazing. So, uh, but she's such a great actress now, but like, dang, she, she, well, that was she an uphill also, battle because she, she didn't know shit. She had also picked up critical acclaim quickly. Just not for this. <laughs> yeah, just not for this. That's crazy risky just getting this person who has never acted before to be the the star of your film. I love Jeff Bridges as the hippie scientist. But then even this part we could look back see like when you first see a really great actor you just kind of think that's who they are. You know? So seeing Tony Collette in The Sixth Sense, you just figure, uh, well, you know, she's just like kind of not exactly high class Brooklyn working woman, single mom, you know, and that's just kind of who she is. Yeah. And then when you see later performances, you realize what kind of an actor they are and how genius that is. So the same thing kind of applies to Jessica Lange, who now having recognized what a great actress she is and what a talent she is, for her to, blow, to pull off the part of a complete bubble-headed fucking bimbo. Yeah. That's talent. Yeah, it is. It's talent. Yeah. So, uh, Jeff Bridges I'm is a sure hippie scientist. I'm sure she hated herself him. every day of it. But I, I have never been more attracted to Jeff Bridges as I am in the movie King Kong. Yeah. I'm just saying. Like, he's been in a lot of movies and a lot of different characters, but uh, King Kong, Jeff Bridges can get it. Okay. Uh, Dino De Laurentiis <laughs> wanted this to be such a massive, epic film that Crazy ass mofo built a robot. He built a Megazord. He built yes. a Voltron. Yes. It's freaking crazy. He, he, so this robot was 40 feet tall and weighed almost seven tons. It cost $61,000 to build in 1976. In today's money, that would cost uh, a, about $300,000. But uh, he also built that's robotic. Still, that still sounds relatively cheap for me for a giant fucking ape robot. Yeah, it was also it, but also <clears throat> it wasn't just that robot. He also built a uh, separate giant mechanical arms and giant mechanical hands for, you know, the close ups and stuff like that. So all together, the building of the, the robot and its various parts was one million dollars in 1976 money and it's so great because as it, there's the picture right there right there yes. of yes. the robot sucker barely worked and they only show it for 15 seconds of worm. screen time so it's only up there for 15 seconds of screen time and i love that it is so fake it's hilarious yeah even in that 15 seconds it's just Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, like, you can see the the person in the monkey outfit going, ah, 
Rah! And then it cuts to a shot where you see King Kong going. Yeah. All slow and it's freaking hilarious. The script was written by Lorenzo Semple Jr. And I heard that name and I went, that sounds familiar. Turns out he wrote the dumbass 60s Batman. Oh. Which is why in the 1976 King Kong movie, when the hippie scientist uh, Jeff Bridges punches Charles Grodin's greedy oil executive in the face. You just see this big uh, title screen that says, Bah! Yeah. Uh, you know who is in 1976's King Kong? B-movie actor John Agar has yeah. a small part in King Kong as city official. He starred in Invisible Invaders, Journey to the Seventh Planet, Attack of the Puppet People, The Mole People, Revenge of the Creature, Tarantula, and most notably, put up picture six, John Agar's eyes shot lasers on the poster for 1957's The Brain from Planet Eris. Yes. So yeah, he's in it. I thought that I did, that's a bit odd. That's right up there with the fact that Roger Corman is in Apollo 13. Yes. And it's like, oh. Oh. Well, that shouldn't be there. But okay. <laughs> Whatever. Sure. So yeah, the creation of the King Kong reboot was a shit show. But here's the kicker. The chewy center of the story. This was and originally... It was, and it was huge. Before we belabor the point, uh, I was there. It was fucking, this was being built up as, like, Star Wars hadn't come out yet, but this was me meant to be a blockbuster, huge yeah. movie. And that was one of the things that I wanted to mention in this historic approximation, is that a lot of people say that this is a bomb, but it wasn't a bomb. This was a success. This was all over the place. They sold a shit ton of merchandise. It was everywhere. This film was a hit. But I read a crap ton of articles about King Kong to make this a uh, historic approximation. And everyone said the same thing. Well, Jaws ended up making this much amount of money. King Kong ain't Jaws. Yeah. Get King Kong out your damn mouth. Stop comparing, stop comparing Jaws to King Kong. These aren't the same films. It, this is exactly what they did with the American Godzilla movie. That was a hit. It made like 500 million, 600 million. Sure, nobody liked it, but it still sold tickets. Yes. <laughs> just, because, just because people thought it was cheesy and stupid doesn't mean that it wasn't a success. So now people think that this movie bombed, but it didn't bomb. Let me tell you what bombed, the frickin' sequel, but that's a totally different story. Yes. Uh, so, Dino De Laurentiis, when it, it was his, uh, when he decided to make this movie, he had two very specific ideas for this new 1970s version of King Kong. Number one, uh, he wants it set in the present day. So it'll be set in 1976. And number two, instead of having the climax take place on the Empire State Building, oh, I've got an idea. B, I've got a great new place that we can have King Kong uh, climb on because it's new, it's shiny, it's iconic, and it will no doubt stand tall forever. The world... The twin, the World Trade Center. Yes. The Twin Towers. So that is where uh, the climactic ending of 1976's King Kong happens. It happens uh, at the World Trade Center. And uh, to be fair, 1970, in terms of King Kong climbing things, 1976 is an outlier. 1970, yeah. 1976's King Kong is to the King Kong franchise what um, 
like a Halloween H two. Like it, it's what uh, uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween movies are to the Halloween franchise. Yes, it can it, be I mean, accepted. And and trust me again, I am I am hardcore King Kong. Okay. Yeah. It is my Thanksgiving ritual. King Kong is yeah. highly, highly King Kong centric. Uh no, it's not it, it's it's not really quite a King Kong movie, but it no. has its own charm. Yeah. Uh so even even if you went to Jeff Bridges and said, "Hey, what is King Kong climb?" He would say, "Yeah, he climbs the Empire State Building." So, um, this is the reason why I wrote this historic approximations. I saw a picture of a protest. Apparently, uh, everyone's like, "Oh, King Kong's going to be climbing the World Trade Center. That's awesome." Yeah, but you know who didn't think it was awesome? Employees at the Empire State Building. Okay. So they protested the 1976 King Kong. They climbed to the 102nd floor of the Empire State Building, and they picketed with picket signs and chants, and all of them, here is the great part, they all wore cheap gorilla outfits. Oh. To protest, and I saw this picture on Instagram and here's the thing. I will find a picture or a meme or an article and I'll screenshot something and I'll put it on my computer. And so on my computer, I've got like 30 pictures of upcoming shafts. But for whatever reason, I didn't save this one freaking picture. My wife and I spent a whole day online trying to find the picture of this protest. And of course we couldn't. It's Tostitos all over again. Oh, there's no picture. But I saw the picture. I know the picture exists. So, put up the fourth picture. I couldn't find the picture. So I thought, what picture should I put for the fourth and final picture? How about I'll just pick a random picture to get Bunny off the trail of what this uh, segment will be about. So instead of posting a picture of King Kong, I've, it's a picture of Donald Trump and Grimace. Hooray! Misdirection. Yes. Nice. It, it, let's not forget that Donald Trump was the first president to ever win a hair versus hair match at a WrestleMania. Yes. And Donald Trump was the first ever uh, president to not only cross the demarcation line and go into North Korea, but he was also the first president to ever have a one on one sit down with Grimace. Yes. This is a big deal. This this yeah. is huge. This is like the Nixon Frost interviews. So that's it for his. And he came process. very very close from getting from getting Grimace and Ronald to shake hands it's after crazy. all those I've, years. I've but seen video. He failed. I've seen video of their meeting, and Grimace is just yelling in Russian and slamming a. a a shoe onto a table. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Grimace was going to bomb Florida. It was insane. So that's it for historic approximations this week. Next week, we tackle the true story of America's first mockumentary in Gagi and how freaking racist it is. Uh, if you're interested, it's on YouTube. It's on archive.org. It's all over the freaking place. It's racist as hell. But that's next week. Join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with historic approximations or HAP! And cut on that. <laughs>